Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Welcome to our podcast today. We have the amazing Tony Moore Esquire with us today. She is an attorney and business strategist with over 20 years of business structuring, real estate, asset protection, and estate planning experience. For more than 15 years, Tony has created companies, restructured companies, developed and assessed corporate compliance plans to ensure compliance with applicable rules and regulations. Now you might be thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be a snooze fest. Oh no, it is not. Tony is a dynamo and she has an incredible success story to share with us. Welcome, Tony. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. This is going to be so fun. Absolutely. I just can't wait to hear your entire story. Um, I, I almost couldn't get the podcast started because you started telling me little snippets. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So tell us about your journey to the amazing success you have today and um, any of those little uh, amazing things that happened to you, the challenging things that happened to you along the way. Absolutely. I mean, for the most part, I make sure that I look pretty and glossy and I put on, you know, my big hat sometimes and I put on my pearls and everything else, you know, just, to, you know, I, I love that kind of stuff. It's almost like I get a chance to play dress up every day, you know, and I get a chance to like come and talk to the celebrities and tell them to sit their assets down. <laughs> but it wasn't always like this. You know, I was, I was always in the beginning. I, t I remind people like you see the fancy smanty and all that good stuff, but I was just the kid who had a big dream. Like I'm from Harrisburg. If anyone knows where Harrisburg is, it is a snooze fest. Okay. Like literally it's like a small town. It's surrounded by cows, you know, and dairy farms. And it's surrounded by like our big, big thing, which I still love, but I haven't been in a while was the farm show where you get pickled eggs <laughs> and pickles. And we're like, Oh my God, the farm shows in town. I mean, that's, that was my life. Right. And I lived two hours away from Philadelphia where I live near now. And I didn't know anything about anything. I just knew that, you know, I was one of eight girls and we were poor, poor, Oh, actually, I tell people all the time, we were not, we we're not poor because poor gives you the options and the resources. No, we were Oh, okay. Um, mm. We, I, I lived in, um, I lived in shelters because my mom had eight girls and she ended up with her second husband was a very abusive man. And so sometimes we would just, you know, have to escape from him, especially when he was drinking. Um, we lived in shelters. We lived in other people's basements. Sometimes I got a chance to live with my god mom, who's much, um, well, let me just let you know, my parents were teenagers. Okay. So it was like having that type of life, but still the one thing that I always am grateful for now that I'm closer to 50 is that I'm glad that I didn't lose hope, you know, like I always wanted to see, uh, you know, the other side. I'm like, what would the other side look like where I had a, a father and a mom and I had a pink canopy bed and a pink wardrobe and everybody thought I was crazy. But, you know, I'm so grateful that I actually had that desire and the hope to live that happily ever after. You know, I mean, I still put it in my copy with regards to now I call it wealthier ever after. So um, for three years, I got a chance to go to the Milton Hershey School. If you don't know anything about the Milton Hershey School, it's in Hershey, PA. And once again, at once upon a time, it had dairy barns because I had to milk a cow and we'll just call the cow Betsy. And we had a Betsy and I had a tussle, you know, where Betsy had me sliding down, you know, 
the funkerizations of what Bessie would release. And I had to scoop up and put it into the troughs, right? So for those three years that I was hanging out with Betsy and almost getting beaten down by Betsy the cow, you know, at least I got a chance to see something different. Like it was no longer having to go and sneak food from the playground to get food or, or baby where my babysitting, I was babysitting children and I would scrape food off of their plates instead of throwing it away, you know, because sometimes that's all we had was, you know, my mom had eight eight girls. So I was the older one and the older ones only could eat one time, one meal a day, you know? So I just was like at Milton Hershey school, I got a chance to meet kids who were now I'm an age myself, but I already told you I'm almost 50, right? Like Benetton. Do you remember Benetton? You know, like um, all the colors of Benetton. Absolutely. (laughs) So I didn't know anything. You did not look, by the way, Tony, you, uh, I would have thought you were 30 at the most. (laughs) I cannot believe you're almost 50. That's shocking. Yes. Okay. 70s baby. Okay. You know, like a whole bunch of my friends and I will be 50, you know, and we're like, and I, and I'm gonna do that 50 weird challenge. You know what I mean? So I'm looking forward. <laughs> well, you to make that. 50 look really good. Awesome. Thank you. You know? Um, so, but Milton Hershey changed it. Like, this is some crazy stuff because I'm one of those straight shooters, tell it like it is type of people. So when the counselor would be like, well, Tony, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I was just like, well, Mind you, this is, you know, before Tony, before Milton Hershey school, I was like, so I'm going to um, hook up with a drug dealer and I'm going to start my own hair shop. And she was like, what are you talking about? You know, but that's all I I knew, you know? So she was just like, um, well, you're very smart. Maybe you should go to college. And I was like, college, we don't know anything about college. Like it was just good for me to just have my own bed and have my own clothes and not have to worry about whether or not my mom snuck off because she didn't want to be a mom anymore, as opposed to like thinking about what's next. Right. But I had two teachers. Um, one of them was like dead set. She was like, she was very proper. I loved every bit of her. She's like Miss Shepherd, And she was like, no, young lady, you're going to go to college, you know? So I was just like, okay, I'm going to go to college. I was like, but well, I don't have any money. But it was good for me to be at Milton Hershey School during those three years uh, because I had someone who spoke college. And I also had someone who was like, we had to do career day in Harrisburg. We were not doing career day. And I, they were like, what do you want to be? I was like a hairdresser and I'm be with a drug dealer. And someone in career day was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. It is crazy because Ooh. I was just like, oh, I, I want to be a lawyer. It was just, I never heard of it before. <laughs> you know what I mean? I had like, I was super smart, but I was just like, I just was thinking I'd end up with a drug dealer. So like after a year and a half at Milton Hershey school, I thought I'd end up with a basketball player. They were like Ooh. a basketball player. I was like, it's yeah. not a drug dealer. You know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> That's a big step up from drug dealer. Unfor- unfortunately, but I'm, I ended up with both, but you know, that's another story. So, mm, um, wow. We might have to have another podcast interview with you, Tony, <laughs> to get all the scoop. All the scoop, all the scoop, right? So um, when I uh, spent a little more time because it was three years at Milton Hershey School, I heard about this place called the University of Penn and I didn't know about Ivy League schools or anything. So it was great to go from from the projects to Milton Hershey does three years just shifted my whole life. Um, I learned about Milton Hershey and you know their gifting. And then I also heard about this thing called being a lawyer. And by the time I graduated, I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, and Oprah. Mm-hmm. I just knew that's, that's all of what those I was things, of course, all of, all of those things. Right. So yeah. I went over to the university of Penn. It was great. Um, I was not prepared because the projects do not prepare you for the university of Penn, nor do the, does it prepare you for a prep school, like legacy kids whose parents always knew that their kids were going to go to university of Penn and, or they were going to take over the mansion. Like at the time I was there, uh, you know, I remember um, there were super rich kids who were there. Even Ivanka Trump was there. You know what I mean? Like she took over a whole suite in her interior designer just took over the room because she wanted to stay on campus, but she got a chance to keep the suite. Right. So when I was there, I met rich kids where I was just like holding on to $10 a month. And they were just like, 
throwing away $10 as tips, you know? And I was just like, it's just something inside of me that was like, I refuse to go back to the projects. After I get a taste of what pin look like, I mean, the first I tell people, you know, that the first year I ended up from a straight A student to academic probation. And I didn't, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know because before I just, things just came to me. I was very smart, but now I have to work for it because I was around super smart people. And then, so I got myself together and then I messed up again. And they were like, look here, girly, you are going to get kicked out of University of Penn. And in my brain, if I got kicked out of University of Penn, I was going to have to go back to the projects. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't even want to go back to a drug dealer. You know, I just wanted to be in a space in the place where people were like, they, it just, it, it was so bad. This is bad, but funny, you know? is that I thought I had was leveling up from the Goodwill to the Parade of Shoes. Remember Parade of Shoes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but these- I also, I also shop at Goodwill. So I remember all the above. <laughs> yeah, right? So I was just like, oh, well, you know, working like three jobs so I can go as Parade of Shoes, you know, and um, and also a, a, a couple of other sort of like Filene's Basement back in the day. And they knew, like the rich girls knew, they knew that these were not like famous makers or whatever. So, you know, so I didn't really fit in with them. And um, and as, after a certain point, I didn't really care to fit in with them. I just wanted to make sure I got far, far away from the projects, right? So I was just like, um, I'm still gonna be, uh, I said I was gonna be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, right? And uh, my, my academic counselor was like, look here, girly you're not doing good in pre-med. Okay. So you need to drop out. You know what I mean? So I was like, okay. And they were like, and uh, look here, girly, you don't have enough um, better scores to go over to the Wharton school. So, but you're doing really amazing in writing classes and history classes. So maybe that's what you should do. And I was just like, okay, well, I, I did always want to be a lawyer in the 10th grade. So I focused on that. I fixated on that and it, and it worked out. Right. So I was like, OK, so I'm no longer going to be the project kid. I am definitely not going to be a dropout because I didn't want to get there and just be like, oh, well, I tried. I'm first generation. No one really supported me. I was like, no, I'm here. I have to do the best that I can. Right. So I graduated, you know, thank God. And uh, I took a year off because I burnt out. Like, I'm just telling you, it's like I didn't know that that there was such thing as a gut course. And I didn't know that, you know, you probably shouldn't take all of these accelerated courses when you're trying to get your grades up. You know what I mean? <laughs> like no one tells you this when you're first generation, it's literally like yeah. you dare to leap, but sometimes you can end up on a whole pile of mess or you can make it a mess for oh, yourself. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that's what I did, but I got through and I got by, by because I had this dream, like, oh my God, Tony, if you become a lawyer, you can help kids and they don't have to suffer like you did, you know? So that was always something that pulled at me. So if, you know, if someone has a dream and, and you're like, I don't have the time for it, literally to me is destiny's whisper of letting you know that there's more is possible than your realities, right? So I took a year off and I went to law school and it was something inside that just came alive. I just loved every single bit of law school. Like I, I went, I got on a journal, you know, I was um, arguing all the time. I even argue with the teachers and professors, which is probably not a good thing. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? You were practicing, <laughs> but, uh, you were practicing your craft. <laughs> exactly. Right. And um, at the time I was just like, wow, my voice matter. And now I think that was like thinking about it. It was like, finally, for the first time in a long time my voice actually mattered, you know, they were just like, and, and it was not like something that people tried to muffle. It was definitely something that they're like, okay, share tone, you dare to share. So let's hear like, um, I mean, certain times I, you know, when I got in that argumentative mode, I was just like, I didn't know how to turn it off because I was very passionate about what I was saying in my position. But then I started to understand and appreciate the power of the words and that the gift of gab really is a good thing, <laughs> you know? So um, so I got, a I chance totally to agree with you on, I totally agree with you on the gift of gab being a good thing, a good yeah. thing. Okay. I'm sorry. And, um, and so the grades actually got me into a couple of really, um, very nice interviews at big law firms. But remember, unfortunately I was a first generation student 
I, I knew my story about brokenness and I knew my story about foster care and abuse and child abuse and not having enough to eat and almost getting kicked out of, I forgot to tell you, Milton Hershey School because my gift of gab, sometimes I was very passionate about my position, you know, and, um, and then almost getting kicked out at University of Penn because I was very passionate about partying. I'm just saying. Um, so when it was time for me to uh, interview- Hey, when you, or, have, a, when uh, you have a passion- When you have a passion, you're like, look, sometimes I, I was going to say when you have a, that's right. That's exactly where I was going. When you have a passion, you got a passion. You got to keep going. Don't let them dampen you. You didn't. I, I, I'm your cheerleader here, Tony. Yes. Right. So, so, uh, so they would, there's always a question. And even to this day at almost 50, that question really makes me go, oh, I'm like a deer in the door. The, 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 uh, what is it like a deer, you know? Um, and they're a like, deer in the headlights. Yes. It's like a deer in the headlights. They're like, Tony. I'm like, yeah. They're like, tell us about yourself. And I've gotten better, I think, because sometimes people are like, damn, you like really put a damper on this conversation, you know? So it was almost like, oh, I forgot. It's a Netflix movie. And oh man, it was, I started watching. I got to finish watching it. But um, when they're like, tell us about yourself in a prestigious world, you know? Um, thankfully, someone, so I was like, well, you know, I was a foster kid and, you know, I was abused. And I wanted to live my best life. And, you know, I was watching, I was reading Sweet Valley High. I don't know if you remember Sweet Valley High books back in the day. And that kept me going. And I was also, you know, really fascinated by unicorns and fantasy land. Like before The Hobbit became a movie, I was reading those books. Okay. And, and so they're looking at me and I wouldn't get a call back at a couple of interviews. Right. And, but they were said, well, tell me about yourself. Well, I'm from a small town and, you know, I'm one of eight girls and blah, blah, blah. And eventually someone was like, come here, honey. And she was like, look, this is, I just need you to know, because I don't know if this is the first time you're ever sharing this or if you've been sharing it. And I was like, I've been sharing it. She was like, so I was like, from one sister girl to another, she was like, when people at a big law firm are saying, tell us about yourself, you need to let them know that you're just like them. You're driven, you're passionate, you have all these dreams and goals, and you want to make life beautiful, or because that's what I want to do. Not the stuff before. I was like, oh, got it. So, you know, it took me a, you know, I, something clicked. It was like, oh, but every once in a while, when someone says, Tony, tell me about your life or tell me what, what brought Tony here? I'm like, well, when I was a kid, stealing lunches at the summer camps, they're like, look, <laughs> is this, do we have the wrong person? And I'm like, oh, you want me to show my makeup version of myself you know what I mean <laughs> you want me to skip all that hard stuff and go right to the the goods the the empowering stuff the the positive stuff we but Tony I feel honored that you're willing to share with us everything because this is real life and I want other people to know, number one, you are so amazing with what you have accomplished. I am in awe. I had no idea when we booked you for this podcast that this was your background. And thank you for not sugarcoating it because there are people listening to this right now saying, wow, if Tony could do that, think about what I could do, right? Right. Absolutely. Have you had that throughout your life where people are like so in awe of what you have accomplished and they get inspired to that they can do the same? Yes. You know who um, I used to really get a chance to talk to were the first generation girls who wanted to do something beyond foster care, you know? Yeah. And so beyond foster care, beyond the drug dealers, beyond the streets, beyond, you know, um, 
having a situation where when we grow up, whew, we don't always have a family to That's give right. birth to them. Yes. But when you start looking at life as an opportunity to go from reality to your dream, when you get to the point where you're like, you know what, I deserve to live beyond my socioeconomic class or a job, you know, for me, I always was very grateful for just going to the next step, right? So it, destiny has a way of teaching you that you're worthy of living your dream life. So after uh, law school, I started out, I was like, uh, someone said, cause I didn't know, I didn't have a blueprint. They were like, oh, if you wanna be a litigator, then you need to be a law clerk. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be a law clerk. But then I was, as a law clerk, I was like, you get all your chance to meet everyone. But then, you know, a couple of times I would tell the judge, look here, judge, you got some opinions. I drafted these opinions. This looks bad on me when you don't approve of them. So I need you. And she would tell her friends, Tony, that's like, she's the judge, you know? So eventually I knew <laughs> I, I couldn't play second fiddle for so long. I was still passionate and opinionated, mm -hmm. right? So I, mm -hmm. um, I went to a law firm in the first law firm, I, um, I, uh, the first law firm, when I interviewed, I messed up because I told a six figure law firm offer that a two figure law firm offer, you know what I mean? Was giving me an opportunity and they were like, Oh, well you got to take it, you know? So I feel like I've always had like someone like was someone would open up the door, but I would mess it up. Which, you know, um, now I realize that sometimes, you know, success doesn't open the door for you, not the road that the less tra traveled sometimes works out for your good. Because going to the smaller law firm, they threw me everywhere. They threw me in litigation. Ah. I had to fight against the big law firm people all by myself. You know what I mean? I ended up with the secretary who wouldn't answer my phone. And I would be like, why didn't you answer my phone? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it was it was awful. Why didn't, you know? she, why didn't she answer your phone, Tony? Well, she there uh, because I was a junior associate and she felt like she needed to be with the senior associate. So I would I would have to pick up my pick up my phone because I'm like, I'm a law firm now. You know what I mean? They're like, no, you you gotta do it all, girly, you know? So uh so and then I ended up in a hot spot because I was still very passionate and I wanted to just do the right thing. But sometimes that passion would end up in, I would be in tears. Right. And I had this one girl, a friend named Heather. And one day I was just bawling out because it was a bad situation. And I was like in a bad situation and I had all these feelings and I'm passionate. And she called me and was like, what are you doing? I was like, <laughs> she's what? Shut the door, put on your lipstick put on your blush. You know what I mean? We're going to have a conversation. So we had a conversation about, you know, just like the mind games because her brother was actually an attorney and somebody else in her family was like a judge. So I was first generation, everything. And she was at least guided along the way. So she knew a few things. And because she knew a few things, she didn't count it robbery to just share it with me. So it was almost like, kind of like earth angels that are like, look here, you're messing up, but you're still supposed to be here, right? So that really helped me with regards to not just putting it all out there because I was not good at playing, um, what is it, uh, poker. Like if, if I had a good hand, I'd be like, like, and if I had a bad hand, I'd be like this, oh my God. Like I would have all these faces like, oh my God, this is great. Oh my God, this sucks. You know what I mean? And I didn't know how to just be like a uh, pass or just BS my way, right? So mm -hmm. I learned a lot at that law firm that I found out years later, if I had gone to the bigger law firm, first of all, they were crazy. Okay. Because they had, mm -hmm. the girls had to compete with the guys and the guys had fiancés or wives who would just take over. But the girls such as myself, we would have babies and they'd be like, Oh my God, you're no longer interested in law. And you're, you're like, um, yeah. You got kids. I got kids. I just got to give birth to them, but I'll be back, you know? Right. So I, yeah. So I started um, my own firm, but 
eventually I ended up going to another firm. So I left the first firm, started my own law firm, didn't know what the hell I was doing. But thankfully there were some earth angels. And this time it was like three guys who had their own law firm. So they allowed me to uh, rent an office in their office. And they gave me some cases that they didn't want to take, which was good. But eventually my husband was like, look here, girly, you're smart, you're a lawyer, you need to make some money. So I ended up at another law firm where I got a chance to work. It was just so crazy because that road to success, I just thought that when I showed up from the University of Penn and then I showed up from law school, then it'd be like, ta-da, take your pick. But no, it was more like Little Red Riding Hood and Goldilocks smooshed together. And then there was always <laughs> like, I don't know, Adam Kutcher saying, you're, you know what I mean? Like, you know, this, this is like, you know, at the end of the day, someone's making a joke and we want to see, it's like the universe is like, we want to see what you do. Like, what, what will you do now that you know, you know? And, and I'm like, am I being punked? You know, like every time I was ended up in a situation was, well, am I being punked? But I think really, I think the universe was like saying that until you say yes to the best, like I was just saying yes, because the door was open. I wasn't looking for something for me. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I didn't, I you weren't like, being picky like, enough. Yeah. I wasn't picky. I wasn't picky enough. I was just like grateful. You that were settling. Was, yes. Yes. And you know what opened up my, my, um, my situation, my whole eyes and everything got changed was during that time between, I guess my second or third law firm and moving to another job that gave me rest was that one of my sisters, younger sisters, was, um, she ended up with a gunshot wound to her stomach. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. And it was awful, but I'm a, a it, it was awful. And I'm gonna just let you know that it was awful that she ended up with a gunshot wound. It was awful seeing my sister in that situation because at one point she did live with me. And I was just thinking that if I just can, get them out of their situation like Milton Hershey did for me and just give them some Mm -hmm. blueprints or some breadcrumbs for my success, then it would just, ta-da, everything would just work out for their good. Mm -hmm. But I never thought about life happening or mental health issues, you know what I mean? Or the fact that sometimes we lose hope. Like when we lose hope, we, we lose the way, right? So when she, when I saw her in the hospital, by then I had a son and he wasn't one yet. And I saw her in the hospital and I was just like, what happened? And she was just like, I was trying to get his attention and things got wrong and all this other stuff. And she's in the hospital. And it was like almost like 16 years ago. And I remember it because this is what shifted for me. Like before I was, like you said, I wasn't picky enough about the opportunities. I was just literally still like the foster kid. Like, thank you so much for not getting rid of me. Thank you for so much for opening up the door. And um, so when my sister either shot herself or was forced to shot herself, but she told me she shot herself to get his attention, you know, she survived the gunshot, you know, for a while. She survived a gunshot. I ended up in the hospital a month after she was released because I ended up being pregnant. Mind you, I have like an eight month old son. And I was just like, oh my God, like once again, I can't get, you can get far away from the ghetto, but the ghetto won't get far away from you. Cause I was just like, that wasn't part of the plan. The kids were supposed to be 18 months apart. Not like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like. I didn't even know it was possible to get pregnant after just eight months. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) Irish twins, honey. You know what I mean? (laughs) I do know. I do know. My brother and and I are like that. We are Irish twins. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Cause I used to be like, how did that happen? And then I'd be like, oh my God. Like they were literally like about the same age for like two weeks or a month. And then someone mm-hmm. gets older, right? So I yep, ended that's up- that's how my a, brother and I are. <laughs> really in a bad, bad, bad situation. Uh-huh. And I was just like, my sister got out of the hospital and I ended up having an ectopic pregnancy. So I didn't want to tell the law firm that I was at that I was pregnant. Um, so after I had a partnership meeting, right, we had a partnership meeting. They were like, look, you're awesome. You're amazing. I remember I wasn't picky, but anytime they told me, I just wanted them to see that I was worthy of the job, worthy of the opportunity. And, um, and then something 
something happened. It was like a glitch in my stomach and I didn't want to be like, oh, I have a girly issue. So what ended up happening was I went home. I knew I was pregnant, you know, but I went home and the next day I woke up and I saw that I had stains, you know, where a woman who's pregnant shouldn't. And so I just was, I picked up my son. My husband was like, are you okay? I said, I have stains. More than likely we, we lost the baby, but I'm just going to clean up. I'm going to take my son to, to the daycare. Cause I had to go back. Remember, I was still thinking I wasn't worthy. I had to prove my, my worth. Right. So I just cleaned myself up and I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to just go back to the office. Cause the night before we had that partnership talk about what I needed to do to be partner and to make more money, even though my job was crazy. I had like, I had a caseload that was crazy. Um, so the, so the, I remember earth angels. So the daycare provider was like, Tony, what's going on? You're like, you're a little pale and I'm a black chick, but you could tell something was wrong, but I was trying to get back to the office. Right. So I was like, oh, I miscarried. Um, I'm going to take care of it, but I have to go to the office. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy. So I missed the train. Once again, even though the universe tries to make a fool of you, destiny always shows up. Right. And so I'll just, you know, I called my girlfriend. I was like, I missed this train. Something is wrong. Can you just take me to the hospital? You know, I don't remember any more conversations after that, but um, I woke up on the other side of the hospital in intensive care. And I had called my secretary and I was just like, and she actually answered my phone. Like this one, the third law firm, she finally answered my phone. And she was like, Tone, what's up? You know, and I was like, oh my God, I need you to cover for me because I, you know, had a miscarriage and I didn't want anyone to know that I was pregnant, you know? And, and I was like, so can you cover for me? She's like, girl, no one cares. No one's, no one's gonna care about you more than you care about you. And if you ended up dying from this ectopic, it wasn't even a miscarriage, it was ectopic pregnancy, the partners may have gone to your funeral or maybe not, but promise you, you would have been replaced. And so I was just like, she doesn't know. She doesn't get it. You know what I mean? Cause I'm still thinking I need to prove myself worthy. I mean, girl from the projects to pen to the penthouse at the partnerships meeting, like there's not too many of us who have that conversation. Right. So you gotta be strong and courageous and all that good stuff. So, um, so I ended up leaving the hospital and I was back in my office the next day, right? Then I start having these destiny dreams that I was pregnant again. And I was like, wow, this is so crazy. But we, I have twins in my family, right? My Two of my sisters have twins and one of my cousins lost a set of twins. So I was just like, oh my God. So I was going on Google and say, could this happen that you can have an ectopic and a pregnancy? And you can you can. So I, I went to Walmart and I was just like, wow. oh my God. Yeah, you can, right? But here's the sad thing is that what ended up happening was the doctors didn't give me a DNC. Like they didn't clean me out afterwards. So that's the remnants was still stirring up and they were multiplying and growing. And so, oh but gosh. for the dream, oh I wouldn't gosh. probably be talking about this conversation. And, um, and then I was just like, once again, trying to take care of it, you know, like with well, the doctors, like you got to get some methotrexate, you know, and I was just like, okay, what does that take? And how do I get back to the office for partnership? Right. And so every, I had to do three sessions and I would sneak off to the hospital to get the sessions because I still wasn't thinking that I was worthy of living the life that I wanted until day three, the third session. And it was an, it was an Indian woman. She's a doctor. And she was still the same doctor who I saw when I had the ectopic pregnancy, um, where the tubes kind of like burst, right? She was like, look, do, do yourself a favor. Please do not get pregnant anytime soon because all of these chemicals we put in your body will really mess your child up, you know? And so I was talking to someone else wow, about it. That's terrifying. Yeah. And I was like, what? So I was talking to my girlfriend and she was like, you don't get it. But I have another friend who I was telling her about it. And I was telling her, like, I'm telling you. And she was like, 
she knows my whole story and she's like a doctor's daughter, but she knew me from Harrisburg and it didn't matter. And we're still friends to this day. And now she's like an associate professor who wants to be, you know what I mean? Get a tenure and all that good stuff. And we have been friends for a very long time. And she is like, she just burst out crying. And I was like, why are you crying? She's like, because your life has been so traumatizing to you that you don't even know that you were in post-traumatic stress from your sister trying to shoot herself to all of this stuff and you're and you don't get it and finally when I got it I was just like oh my god I, I could have died you know like a lot of women die and I would then that's when I said a prayer to the divine heavenly father and I was just like I ah, please like the same way you didn't let me be an almost woman at Milton Hershey and you didn't let me become an almost woman at University of Penn please don't let me die as an almost woman I want to be the woman of my dreams, even if I have to start all over. Let me just tell you, don't you ever say a prayer to the heavenly fathers of the universe without <laughs> putting conditions on those specifications. So did you get to start all over? Is that what you got? I literally started all over. <laughs> literally. I went from a corner office at a law firm to being on the phones for the federal government of United States. Wow. But that's starting over. You, you are a very powerful woman, Tony, because you drew to you exactly what you asked for. I did. And I got a chance to start over. Yeah. You know, I got a chance to start over. Like literally the first two years, I was literally in professional shock because I was like, wait, I don't have billable hour requirements. Wait, the weekend is mine. You, what am I supposed to do after work? You know what I mean? Like, I didn't <laughs> you had a life. Oh my gosh. You didn't know what to do. You had a life. I surely did not know what to do. I literally did not know what to do. Um, so then that's when I started to take a journey to me, you know, I was like, Oh, so what do I like to do? You know, you know, and I was like, okay, I like to read. So I started reading and then I started like taking like arts classes and learning how to sew, you know, um, my son, you know, he was, uh, he was one, so he didn't have to worry. Like when he was seven weeks old, I ran back to the law firm, you know, because I was like, I can't lose my job. They need to know that I'm worthy, but you know, so we got a chance to do some, uh, little gym and, and a couple of things and play dates and stuff like that, you know? And I was just like, um, it, it really worked out because if I didn't dare to leap from the law firm to government, like, now, granted, I obviously misread the, the the key, you know, job description, but if I didn't do that, I don't know who I would be right now. I'm sure I would be divorced. Okay. I'm pretty sure oh, of that. Yeah. And I'm sure that I probably wouldn't have my second child who's 13 now because of the fact that, you know, after oh. all of that ectopic craziness, I ended up um, having to go through infertility, which crazy enough. The infertility hospital was literally around the corner from my new job. Wow. And yeah. they only charge, like, I'm sure people, it's, it's not even in existence, but they only charge $7,900 for a cycle. Wow. Yeah. I just had to pay for the That's drugs. a dis deep discount. Huge. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. yeah. And- I had the weekends to myself and literally only had to work eight hours, you know? So if I didn't dare to leap, I don't know what type of woman I would be because that's how I got a chance to leap into my possibilities. Um, what the sister who shot herself, she ended up passing away. Um, and another sister ended up passing so away sorry. from domestic violence, you know, like she didn't know her oh worthiness, you know? Um, and it was like really sad. And so I literally was in a slumber for like a whole year. But then when I woke up, I was just mm. like, in my brain, I was thinking, well, if no one talks about our worth and no one talks about our values and, and no one really appreciates that it doesn't matter how far we've come and how many times we stumble, that we get a chance to 
dare to leap into the next possibility and the next possibility and or to a whole new story because my sister refused to leave that story, you know? And so when I woke up, it was like almost 10 years ago and I started realizing I get a chance to speak. Like before I've always been the background singer. You know what I mean? I've always been the helpmate. I've always been the one and be like, I'd be like, oh, here's a great idea, but you can have it. You know what I mean? And so pretty much almost like 10 years ago is when I realized that it was okay. Actually it was, it was November 21st of 2012. And I realized that it was okay to, to voice my dreams and it was okay to take the mic and it was okay to be very passionate about living my best life, you know, and not it. Oh, and it was okay to do it without permission. And for all of the girls who I used to tell who was in foster care, it's like, that's okay. Like, we're going to be like Cinderella and they're going to take stuff, but eventually someone is going to come and find us like, like either Jerry Warbucks or, you know, we're going to find a prince and he's going to take us far, far away. And then now in my latter years, I'm like, no, nah, we got to go through some ish. But at the end of the day, we're still strong enough. You know, uh, we're, we're still worthy enough. We, we still get a chance to live our life. And maybe it's not always the best and it's sunshine and roses and ponies and stuff like that. And sometimes like the universe will give us a hand. But I think that sometimes it'll also give us, you know, some situations that you have to realize that, guess what? The same way some people get an easy life, some people get a jacked up life. But it doesn't mean that we're jacked up. It just means Mm -mm. that we got to figure out some kind of way to make it right for us. And the best way for me, what I realized is that it's like almost like in the hero's journey where they was like, I met the lions and I met the tigers and the bears and I met the liars and the deceivers. I met some coaches who led me to the bank and then laughed at me and left me. But there was always (laughs) an earth angel. (laughs) You know what I mean? Oh, always an earth angel who kind of was like, take this path or an earth angel, like who, you know, even in the coaching industry, this one guy was like, you're amazing and you're powerful and you don't always have to be the participant. One day you can be the president. Just think of yourself as being the president, you know? And so Mm -hmm. each day I, I, I realized more and more that every single move we make, every move you make, you know, every step you take is going to lead you to something. If you you have a vision for it, you know, that, I mean, that that's my, I'm, I'm a walking, talking epistle. Sometimes I have family members, um, who who aren't blood relatives, but they're still family, you know, if you feel me. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, why are you telling your business? I'm like, it's not my business. (laughs) It's my story, you know, to help someone else because we're stronger together. If I didn't know about Oprah Winfrey and her story, I would have felt like I'm the only person with that situation. And if I didn't, you know what I mean, hear about other people's story, Martin Luther King wasn't the only person who had the dream. And you know what I mean? There's a lot of us who have dreams and just reading other people's. That's why I like personal development. I love coaching. And I, you know, I love being a lawyer, but it's just something about even lawyering. I just be coaching them like, okay, do do you want to end up here? Do do you not have a vision for Mm -hmm. your life? Are you always going to be the damsel Mm -hmm. in distress? Because I'm going to tell you right now, mm-hmm. Romeo ain't coming. Prince Charming is a farce, <laughs> okay? Right. You you got to be your own rescue. You know, I think Lisa That's Nichols. Right. But, you know, you got to be your own rescue. And I just own that lane of just being like, you know what? As long as I make myself a priority, I'll become the woman of my dreams. With or without mm-hmm. a man. Like, my husband's here. He'd be like, but we've been together for like 25 years. I'm like, ooh, I love you. I do. Right. But that's not yeah, taking. But I don't have to have you to do what I want to do. Can can yeah. can we say that a little louder so he can hear us from the background? <laughs> I tell him I say you you are a bonus. I'm a bonus, but you know that's I right. never want you to feel as though like every step I've taken before you and after you, I don't want you to think that is because of you. It's right. because it's for me to choose. Just like all of us to choose if we're going to dare to leap or we're going to sit on our Mm -hmm. dreams. We're going to watch and wait for somebody to say, you're good and you're pretty and you're smart. Are you going to tell yourself Mm -hmm. every freaking day in the mirror that you deserve this? Mm -hmm. It's worth Mm -hmm. it because you deserve it. Yeah. 
So Tony, um, I've got so many questions for you, but let's start with this one. Um, where do you want to go now? What is your big dream moving forward? Because you still have so much that you, I can feel that you're going to accomplish. So what's your dream now? What's your next one? And the one after that, and the one after that, what is the big dream that you want for yourself now? For me, if my dream now is like, I look around and I'm like, this is like, this life is good now, but now it's not mm -hmm. about surviving life anymore. It's about what's next. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm at this point yeah. in my life where I've never seen this before. I've never seen this before. Like I literally, when I got married, before I got married, y'all, I would tell <laughs> people that my husband was my first husband because the women in my mom and my godmom, they had multiple husbands. So I just felt as though that was their story and that's going to be my story too. So mm -hmm. I'm at this point where I'm just like, the newest thing that I did was I was like, I'm a coach. So I was like, can you be my life coach? I'm like, eh, I'm not that coach. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 but, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, cause I, you know, I was a, I was a former athlete. So sometimes you have to give yourself, you got to bench yourself, but then sometimes you got to like say, okay, but I want to get off the bench. I want to be the VIP on this team. And if you become the VIP in your own life. So if I can read, just serve as a reminder, you know what I mean? Like from a seed, just the seed, of my, uh, just a little seed of like nothingness. I used to tell people, I'm like nobody. Like if you told, throw names at me, it's, I'm not even going to catch them because I don't know anybody. You know what I mean? Um, but when you understand and appreciate and people do it, you know, the name droppers and blah, 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 oh, blah. Sure. And that's what it sounds like to me. Unless it's Beyonce or Rihanna, you know what I mean? <laughs> or, <laughs> or, you know, Oprah. like, um, <laughs> You know, I love Marie Forleo. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And Gabby Bernstein, mm -hmm. which is amazing. She's like the one. Mm -hmm. Now I will tell y'all this. Okay. She's the one that really opened my eyes. Cause the whole time I was like, I'm, I go to church, but I'm one of those back, back, back all the way in the backseat parishioners who showed up mm -hmm. before Corona. I show up right before the pastor preaches and then I'll be tipping out afterwards. Praise the Lord. But I was there. You know what I mean? I'm like, I was mm -hmm. here, Lord. I was mm -hmm. here. And um, Gabby Bernstein mm -hmm. uh, wrote a book and I forgot which one it was. That was so amazing. Um, and she talked about um, A Course in Miracles. And I was just like, wait a minute. And she, and then I saw an interview and she was like, oh yeah, I was talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, black people, we used to call it the Holy Ghost, right? I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. She had her holy instant moment. I had a few holy instant moments and I didn't realize that it really was my holy instant to be awakened and aware of, of my possibilities, right? So I went yeah. back to church with A Course in mm. Miracles in my hand, not, not the Bible. <laughs> I love it. I, love I was it. like, hey. So are you coaching? Are you coaching people now? Um, I'm doing my own version of coaching, right? Because as a That's lawyer- a good thing. Yeah. As a lawyer, I, um, I did it for 10 years. I didn't know it was called coaching then when I was helping women and their divorce and I would like curse them uh -huh. out. I don't think that's what coaches do. And I'd be like, what the <laughs> F you know what I mean? Like you can't just be crying over this. Don't get so digmatized and stuff like that. Right. But, um, but uh -huh. I would just remind them of, you know, finding the power within themselves, you know, to start over, you know, especially when, he leaves. And especially when you have children and especially when, especially as long as you're breathing, I feel like there's something inside of you that gives you the power to become. So, you know, so I told, I told my crew, I was like, okay, I'm going to start business coaching. They're like, what does mm -hmm. that mean? I was like, well, I've been giving it away for free, you know, That's because right. when someone says, well, I want to start a nonprofit. And then I was like, great. Well, they'd be like, so what do I do next? And what do I do next? And what do I do next? Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, is that what coaching is? So I didn't really know that that's what coaching was because that's what I did. As an adjunct professor, mm -hmm. I would just literally guide them through the blueprint of success. And as a mm -hmm. lawyer, especially a trial attorney, I'm like, look here, we're not losing, okay? <laughs> this is what you need to do. And this is what you need to do. And did this happen? And I need some supporting and we're talking over discovery questions or what. 
I didn't know that that was called coaching, you know, but I love every bit of mm-hmm. it is like pulling out the potential mm-hmm. in someone else so that they can become possible. Yes. That's amazing. I didn't know that though. You didn't mm-hmm. tell me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody is listening to this and they feel like they have lost hope mm-hmm. or they aren't realizing their worthiness and probably all the above, what advice do you have for them? I would give them three things, right? First, I would tell, I'm going to look you deeply in your eyes and I want you to just remember, just remember a dream where you were living and loving and you were overcoming a dream that was in your head, a dream that you felt, a dream that you imagined. I want you to think about that dream and I want you to fixate on it. I want you to allow yourself to live that dream first in your head, because here's the thing, your brain doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know if you've experienced it or you imagined it. And the more you imagine yourself winning and the more yourself imagine yourself living the life that you're worthy of living. And the more that you imagine yourself being amazing, guess what? You'll become that because your brain doesn't know the difference. And as soon as soon as your brain shifts, then you shift. You can't settle once your brain expands. You can't, I tried to do it and it's not going to happen, right? So now that your dream and your life has expanded because you smushed it all together in your head, then number two, you have to seek opportunities to live the fullest potential of that dream. So if the dream was to have a business, seek opportunities where you are running a business. Who are you talking to? Who are you helping? What does that look like? Your brain doesn't know. It just needs a target. So now that you've expanded your brain with your imagination, then you're seeking out the opportunities so you can live it out loud. Then the next thing that you have to do is you have to give yourself permission to break through whatever shows up. As a former scarcity mindset, low vibration woman, I'm going to tell you right now, your cousins are going to show up, all your intestate heirs and get legal on you. Like if you die without a will, all those people <laughs> who you didn't even know that you were related to are going to be like, who do you think you are? Been there. Some of your friends are going to say, oh, you're changing. Yeah, and be okay with that. You give yourself permission to expand beyond your realities, permission to be the person on stage, permission to just take over your life, permission to rewrite your script, permission to leap over whatever is showing up. You got to leap over bad marriage, a bad boyfriend, do that. If you have to leap over being a doormat in business, been there, done that do that. If you have to leap over you, even your conversation with yourself, do that as well. Because when you put put it in your mind and you give your permission to expand, then you just got to be it. Just be it. I, I, I always was looking at some people. I'm like, how did he do that? And when you listen for those personal development conversations, you realize that most people are not given the life that they want. Most people are not given opportunities to expand. Most people are not loving the hand that they're dealt with, but when they give themselves permission to be the hero of their story, give themselves permission to expand beyond their belief, then guess what? It's literally like the the universe. It's literally like you're telling the world, open, see me, not open sesame, but open, see me. And the world expands and it just opens up. I mean, (laughs) literally, it's a big difference between wanting and being. So give yourself permission to be. I like like one of my books that I'm writing is called Up Level Your Life because you get a chance to up level into your fullest potential. When you stop watching, you stop waiting, you stop hoping, and you just be. You be a badass. And you just be whoever you need to be so that you can live your dreams. Tony, I love that so much. What great advice. And where can people find your books? Because you already have multiple books out there. Tell everybody about that. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so my books are at Amazon under Tony Moore up level is coming out on March 9th. (laughs) I think that's international woman's day. And that's, that's just me pulling it full out and saying, you know what, this is what I went through. This is what I had to go through, but this is what an opportunity to go from the welfare kids, the damsel in distress to a future millionaire is without family, without a pastor, without someone opening up the door to my success, because I dared to allow myself to go from where I was to where I choose to be and you as well. I love that so much. So amazon.com look for Tony Teo and I more M O O R E. We'll also have a link to that in our show notes, Tony, is there, um, and I also have other links, uh, to your YouTube channel and things like that. So we'll include those. Um, in our show notes also, because I'm going to tell you right now, you have inspired me. I know you're inspiring other people out there and they're going to want more of you, Tony Moore. (laughs) Gracias. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you for spending this time with us today. I appreciate you so much. I'm definitely going to have to have you back on because um, I, I literally have like five questions to ask you, but we're out of time. So I'm going to say bye-bye for now, but not bye-bye for good because we're going to come back. Maybe after you, maybe after your next book is published, we can come back and talk more. Does that sound good? That sounds amazing. And absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate you being here today. And we will let everybody know when you'll be coming back. So um, have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share her feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. (laughs) 